Uh, one of the things that I really love with coming to this venue and especially at this stage, there are two things. One is the size of these speakers are amazing. So I can, sp I can play music much better than I can do back at home. Another part is that this stage is technically floating means that every time I go up on it, I need to consider my own mortality. I am not entirely sure that I will survive the event, but I'll take it. This is the Untruthful Arch. This has also been called the Angry Swede for an hour. I'll come back to why. This session, for starters, it's not designed to make people uncomfortable. It's not designed to make people angry. It has been known to do just that. And again, that is not my intention. But as we walk through these five scenarios and five things, you're going to see exactly why my blood pressure tends to rise as I do this session. And the name, The Untruthful Art, it's a nod to uh, one of the, the seminal works within uh, data visualization. It's called The Truthful Art. It was written by Alberto Cairo. He's one of the, the absolute giants when it comes to um, data viz. He reached out on Twitter uh, about a year back and said, oh, that's a nice, uh, nice name of your session. I needed a pair of new underpants. But he was very kind. He wasn't angry at all. He just thought it was kind of a cool thing. Let's kick off. We live in the world of information. In 2021, uh, it's been estimated to be about 74 trillion gigabytes of data. That's 74 zettabytes. I suspect that more than half of that is probably porn and spam. And the rest is evenly divided between cat pictures, um, music, and selfies, and maybe at the corner some useful data. Uh, but how much of it is true? Well, I wish there was a way of explaining what true is, but we can't. It's just too complex. And in this world of complexity, there are ways to leverage this, not only the information itself, but also the information overload to push an agenda, to change outcomes. And the only thing that's worth, worse than being played, that's being played without you knowing it. We're going to spend the next hour talking about these things. We're going to look at what deception look like. Some of it is going to be plain obvious. Some of it isn't. Some of it is going to make you pissed. How to spot foul play? Most of the time, unless someone is lying to your face, there are going to be some red flags. Not always, but often. And we're also going to see what makes the data visualization craft so extremely dangerous. Most of us are predominantly visual. That means that we take in visual information and, and do a lot with it. Thus, we're kind of susceptible to everything that I'm going to show you. My name is Alexander. Uh, I'm going to tell you that in a bit. My goal today, I should say, um, is to show you the central tenet of visual trickery. Ourselves. We see what we want to see, literally. So by creating a possible narrative, I can mislead just about anyone. And that's all it takes. My name is Alexander. I am not an American. I am a Swede, i.e. from slightly to the right of Norway. I have spent 24 years in data, anything from databases to analytics, the whole nine yards. If there's data, I'm doing it. It's kind of neat to be able to say, yes, I work with data. Or in Sweden, oh, yeah, you'll buy my data. Then again, it, it turns out, for the ones in here that actually speak Swedish, that picture walking into a bar and going, ja, yeah, you'll buy my data. You're going to go home alone. <laughs> Ask me how I know. So yeah, I work as a principal solutions architect for Atalo in Sweden, a Stockholm-based BI company. That is probably the best title I've ever had because nobody knows what I do. The thing is, it's kind of easy to explain what I do because I make data matter. Only data that matters can have any impact on anything, and that's, at the end of the day, it's all about business. It's not about tech. I, um, I used to um, go all over the world. 
to speak at conferences, to teach courses and all that stuff. And then the world ended. And I've kind of been stuck in my home office. It's a great home office, but I'm pretty sure that the walls are actually moving slowly, inching in. Uh, so it's so good to be able to go out until the world ended again yesterday. But this still, it's much better than my home office, just, just saying. If you were in my home office, I'd be kind of concerned. I'm one of seven data platform MVPs in Sweden. I co-host a podcast called Native in Tech. I have some stickers, everybody loves those. I have it on good authority that a computer with stickers is a faster and happier computer. Bet you didn't know that. So just grab any stickers you want. And for the people in here that are my age or older, yes, that is the Doom game logo. Probably the best game ever done. So let's go to the first part. This is Greta. Greta is angry. She's very, very angry because she's gotten into her little head that the world is going to shit. And she's kind of concerned about this and would very much prefer that the world leaders would do something about it. Is the world going to shit? Well, maybe, maybe not. Let's look at a few things. This was put on by the National Review, a, um, an American outfit that's, um, what do you call it, a uh, conservative news outlet. And this is in Fahrenheit, so I, I apologize for that. But they basically say that this is the only climate change chart you'll ever need to see. Mic drop. Really? Do we have any issues with this? Oh boy, yes we do. So uh, let's look at what this actually means. For starters, we can't work with that scale. For starters, let's look at the data around um, 57 degrees Fahrenheit or 13.7 degrees centigrade. This is where the, the interesting things happen. We can start to see a bit of a trend and it's slowly inching upwards, right? What's even more interesting is that this is the absolute numbers. It's not the change. And then there's the small detail that this is the average ocean temperature for the entire globe. Do you think that there might be some local changes and local differences between the different corners of the globe? Huh? Maybe. Let's look at the actual change, i.e. the anomaly. Ha! It would seem that, yes, we are changing, and yes, there is a Pretty decent reason for Greta to be pissed. This is it. This is what the data actually shows us. Hmm. All right, it's gonna get worse. Let's shift into something else. So everything around numbers in, in a visual, in a chart like this, is called scaffolding. We have the axes, we have the labels, all that stuff. What if we were a company selling the absolute latest in um, cat fashion, we can see that the conversion rate, which is the number of people going to our website and going from just browsing to actually buying anything, it's skyrocketed in April. Since my bonus is based off the conversion rate, I'm going to be rich. I'm going to be filter rich. Just look at April. Holy yeah. Um, yeah, no. Um, small detail. Big blue arrow pointing to the y-axis. If I force the y-axis to 6%, I am forcing everything to be relative to that number. Meaning that, holy cow, it's an enormous change in April when it might actually be looking like this. This is what we should do. We should have a zero as a baseline. Suddenly, yes, it's a better conversion rate in April. That's fine. But it's not this enormous change. It's not and artific artificially large change. So um, how do we do this? Well, in Power BI, which is my stomping ground, I do just about only Microsoft stuff, you set the, uh, uh, the, the, the chart to, to auto, basically. That, that's how it will sort the, the zero on itself. It's not, if it's not set on auto, well, you can go in and set it as zero or auto. Okay. 
if you want really good examples of how to completely screw people over when it comes to visuals, I highly recommend Fox News. In fact, I considered calling this session an hour with Fox News. I don't think I would ever be allowed back in the US. Uh, and case in point, I haven't done this session in the US. I don't think I will. There's a reason for that. Fox News does amazing things to data, or I should say uh, horrible things. It's kind of the same thing in this case. It, just look at this wonderful graph. Somebody stole the y-axis. Mm, yeah, uh, we're going to come back to that. So the y-axis is gone. Again, there's a reason for that. Something's kind of funky with the x-axis as well. What is funky? Well, the, the points are not equidistant. They have just arbitrarily put these num uh, points out, meaning that they have an almost perfect line. That's a bit of a warning sign, roughly the size of Texas. Um, okay, so what do we do? Well, you've kind of started to see the pattern. Let's look at the actual base data. That data can be found at the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And it looks like this. Okay, let's plot out the, everything that we see. So we are starting with the arbitrarily pointed numbers, right? So the distance between December 07, September 08, well, it's not the same as September 08 to March 09 and so on and so forth. So let's move these things a tad so it actually looks like the way it should look. Um, yeah, no, my straight line kind of went to, um, it kind of went out the window, didn't it? But it's worse because there is a crap ton of data that they didn't bother to put in there. Because if you actually overlay the data on all the data points, it looks like this. Hmm. And bye-bye went my straight line. Funny that. And finally, for the first part, I'm going to give you this. It's kind of a serious uptick at the end, right? Yeah. The reason for this, because someone had a bit of a meltdown and created a logarithmic scale all of a sudden. Seriously? Why would you do that? We had a great thing going with 80, 90, 99, 99, no! No, you don't do this, ever. And if you do, you should put it out in huge texts. I did something here. Okay, what can we conclude from this? Well, first of all, look at the scaffolding. Look at everything that is around the actual graph. And if it's not there, ah, uh -uh, danger, Willie Robinson, danger. There is a reason why the scaffolding is not there. I'm gonna show you something called fluff in a bit. Kind of the same thing. Also, if you have a bar chart, or generally if you have any charts at all, the axis should go to zero, because that is going to be your baseline, something to compare everything to. There might be specific reasons why you don't want to go for a zero, and that's fine, but again, if you don't, make sure you point it out. And for the love of everything that is holy, do not change axis scales, midstream, because I will find you. Right, so let's go for cherry picking. And cherry picking is kind of the art of um, choosing the data that fits your narrative. And if it's done in science, it's going to be called p-hacking, p for uh, statistical probability. Um, the rest of the world is just called shenanigans, but people really uh, consider it. Now, it's kind of an inception thing that I'm going to do here. Let's see if you catch it. Let's start with this. What am I just doing? Well, I'm doing a couple of things. First of all, I am expecting each and every one of you to have seen Star Wars. If you don't, we have a bit of an issue. I might be a bit of a Star Wars fan, just saying. Now, so most people have seen Star Wars. Most people know the premise of the evil empire and the... Uh, Overlord, Darth Vader, and that the stormtroopers have a pretty limited life expectancy if they don't follow his rules. Well, 
some actually do follow the rules and still perish. That's a whole different story. So by choosing who I ask and frame the question in the way that I can control the answers, well, suddenly, why, why am I doing this? I am creating a question and I'm forcing you down a very narrow path because there is just one correct answer. That's cherry picking in a nutshell. So how do we, how do, we do this in, um, in data? Well, for starters, let's, let's go to Sweden. Did you know, did you know that Sweden turns out to be the second most dangerous country in Europe? Huh, interesting, I didn't know that and I was born there. Uh, this is according to a site called Nambio.com. So by filtering on, on um, crime index by country in 2020, Sweden sticks out like a sore thumb. We are in great company with the Ukraine and France and Ireland and Moldova. Hmm. There's some issues with this. First one is this is self-reported, meaning not only do you need to find this site, you also need to go in and put in data. I kind of see that this is going to happen on Friday evening after a beer or two. And nobody bothered to define danger. So it's going to be, yes, Sweden is very, very dangerous. So what do we do? Well, before we look at the data, who do you think uses this? Well, this has been quoted by the... Um, more, uh, shall we say, racist parts of the Swedish political establishment. Let's look at the data. Again, let's look at the data. Th this is available uh, underneath. Apparently, the number of reported crimes are going up. Yep, that's a fact. The number of um, manslaughters and murder ones and all that stuff is staying at a fairly stable level. Now, this does not take into account the latest shootings. We've had an, an uptick in, in shooting, especially in my city, uh, kind of a bummer, but it's not part of this, this, um, uh, this chart. So what we can conclude here is that the number of crimes being reported is going up. That's the only thing that we can conclude. This does not mean that we're li living in a more dangerous uh, time. Huh. Another great example of cherry picking. This was run by a site called economicshelp.org and it was designed to, to show cherry picking. The UK is still on everybody's lips after the, um, the disastrous Brexit. Yeah, I'm not going to be able to do this session in the UK either for reasons that you're going to find in a bit. And um, this does look a bit strange. Because, again, if we were to look at our old friend, the x-axis, we're going to see that they have kind of constrained this between 1995 and 2016. I'm pretty sure that they had some inflation stuff going on before 1995, probably after 2016 as well. So what if we go and dig out the base data? Again, suddenly it looks like this. They managed to find the smallest part in the data that supports their narrative. What can we conclude from this? Data does not have its own voice. Data is not going to tell you shit that you don't decide it says, or the people trying to tell you. So don't trust data, ever. And uh, case in point, this was put, on, on, put up on Twitter, I think it was three or four months ago. I I'm just stumbled upon it. And I, I decided then and there, yeah, this is going to go into my session. So Björn Lomborg is a Danish, I think, uh, science denier or clients, client, uh, climate skeptic or climate change denier. He put up this one and said, well, apparently this is not as big an issue that people think it is. Unfortunately for him, Andrew Dessler, who is a professor of atmospheric sciences and a climate scientist at Texas A&M, found this and went, uh, wait a second, that's kind of weird. Because yes, the 30s, they were hot. 
but they were not that hot. And why on earth isn't the 2010s showing up at all? Hmm, something is strange. Now, this is EPA data. So the Environmental Protection Agency has put this out. This is correct, validated, verified data. Why does it look the way it does? Couple of reasons. So for starters, this is plotting what's known as the heat wave index. And if I were to ask any of you what the heat wave index would be, we'd have a lot of great answers. None of them would be correct. I'm reading verbatim. A heat wave index counts the occurrence of four day heat waves of temperatures exceeding one in a 10 year recurrence. Okay, that's a kind of um, different view on things. So by choosing this extremely strange metric, you can show this. What if we change the, the way we look at heat wave to something more reasonable? Instead, um, perhaps, let's look at the, the actual temperatures and compare that. Suddenly we're going to look at this. Huh. So the 30s, yes, they were warm. They were not that warm. And then we've had a gradual increase back to the 2010s and 2020s. The funny thing is that there's actually two cherry picks in this single thing. The first one was choosing the very obscure metric. The second one, this is just the US. The world looks a bit different. Funny that. So no, Mr. Lomborg, you can crawl back under your stone. What can we learn from this? Well, look at the agenda. Someone is always trying to sell you something. If you don't know what they're selling, you might be the product. I think you've heard that before. And consider the responders. If I were to ask a very homogenous group something and ask another group that has nothing to do with the first group the same question. We might have two completely different answers. Just saying. And finally, try to examine the base data if you can. We have so much data available to us. It might be kind of a difficult proposition to, to find your way in and find the base data, but most of the time it is there. And you're going to find that a lot of times what's reported is not necessarily supported by the actual data. So let's look at comparisons. Comparisons, while well, comparing things, they're kind of a classical way of driving a narrative. There's a saying that one would compare apples to apples. But I'll show you some creative ways of comparing, well, basically apples to trombones. And uh, in case anybody's wondering, that's a six-valve military trombone from 1866. Comparing stuff is hard. It's even harder if you lack basic literary skills. Literary skills. Uh, how many weeks do we have in August again? Um, yeah, no, not these many at all. Where do you think I found this picture? Which TV station? Ha <laughs> ha, yes, Fox News. Anyways, let's go back to the relative dangers of living. It turns out that living is actually terminal. You're not gonna get away with your life, but that's a different story in and of itself. So this is a visual that plots the relative danger, i.e. the most dangerous cities in the US. We have this small infographic that shows you the relative danger. I don't know how you measure danger. Is that in kilos or in meters? I don't know. And this is what's known as fluff. There is data here, but there's also a crap ton of cool visuals and graphics and stuff that does nothing except make your eyes go like this. You don't know what you're looking at. So if we were to clean this up, remove all the fluff, and just look at the actual data. This is what we're going to find. So Chicago is kind of um, at the top here. And the top, top 10 most dangerous cities in the US, uh, are we missing something? Yeah, 
where's my scale? Where's my x-axis? Somebody misplaced my x-axis, so let's put that in. So this is actually number of homicides per city from 2019. Do we have any issues with this? Yes, we do. I was never very good at geography, but even I know that there is a bit of a size difference between Chicago, 8.9 million people, and Baltimore, the 2.3 million people. So if you were to compare the, the absolute number of people killed, you are probably going to see some differences in the numbers. What do we do? Well, yes, we're going to come back and look at the data, uh, but we are going to uh, control for the size of the city. We can do that by simply saying the homicide rates per 100,000 residents per city. Where did um, Chicago go? Huh. Chicago is not that dangerous, apparently. Well, Baltimore is still more difficult, and St. Louis, you don't want to go there. But again, the fluff didn't show you this. And if you don't control for size, this is what you end up with. And then we had this. This was sent to me uh, by a, um, a former colleague of mine that I've, I've said from the start of this pandemic, I am not going to touch COVID-19 data with a 10-foot stick because the data is horrible. You cannot compare COVID-19 data. And that's all I'm going to say on that. He sent me this and said, this is an interesting example of what? Well, let's see what this actually shows. This is from the UK, and this is the, the um, hospitalized patients, and we can see that Scotland had a pretty crappy day. And what's going on in Northern Ireland? I don't know. Look at the y-axis. Yeah. So at the top of England, we have 30 thousand at the top of northern ireland we have 700 you cannot compare these what are people going to do well we're predominantly visual so we're going to look at the shapes of the, the 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 visuals and it apparently seems like the northern ireland part is a bit iffy you do not compare these like this you need to have a common baseline this is the bbc if anyone should these people should know better. Then we can look at revenue. And as we can see from my company, I am rich. I'm becoming richer. Just, just look at my revenue. It's going up, up, up and away. Kind of awesome. Uh, but if we were to, um, oh, I don't know, look at the, uh, the y-axis again. Kind of a large sum of money. 500 millions, 1,000 millions also known as a billion, one and a half billion. Something is kind of funky here. It's, it's just, it keeps going. Why is this? Well, it's because we are looking at cumulative revenue. And if you weren't told that this is cumulative revenue, you know, we kind of, a, again, look at it and go, yeah, seems reasonable. This is what it actually looks like. But since it's cumulative, you need to have a pretty serious deficit in order for this, the... Uh, the line to dip downwards. So be careful when you compare cumulative or absolute revenues or numbers at all. Compare apples to apples. Do not put any trombones in your data. Taken out of context, that is a very strange sentence. Compare to what? Always have a baseline. I am the best speaker ever. Compare to my cats. My cats have never been on stage. So, yes, you need to compare it to something reasonable. My cats are not reasonable. And please consider absolute versus cumulative, uh, um, cumulative increases. It might look the same on a graph, but look at the scaffolding, look at the text, look at the description. What are we, what are we trying to show you? And it's time to take a turn for the worse. Correlating causation. So, what does this mean? Causation. This is the action of causing something. I'm sure you've heard correlation does not imply causality more than once. And that is extremely true, but it is also something that very few people 
realize what it means. I'm going to show you, for starters, this. Did you know that the per capita consumption of cheese in the US and the total revenue generated by golf courses each year actually correlate? Ha! Huh. But they do not... What? They're no, not causal. I can guarantee you that there is no causation between the consumption of cheese and the revenue generated by golf courses. There is nothing driving the other. They happen to correlate. They don't drive each other. Hold that in your minds, as I'm going to show you something terrible. This is glyphosate, or as it's more commonly known as Roundup. Roundup is a weed killer brought to market by the Monsanto Corporation in 1974. And it's been called many things. For instance, in, in 1996, the Attorney General of New York ordered Monsanto to pull ads that said that Roundup is safer than table salt. Um, it was also practically non-toxic to mammals, birds and fish. The debate whether this is carcinogenic or not is still raging today. And I mean, it's, it's hard to figure out what's true or not, because there's been several lawsuits regarding this, and people have been paid inordinate amounts of money for it, for claiming that this caused their cancer. I don't know. But in 2015, the World Health Organization's International Agency for Research on Cancer, IARC, they classified glyphosate as probably carcinogenic in humans. In contrast, the European Food Safety Authority concluded in November of the same year, 2015, that the substance is unlikely to pose a carcinogenic threat to humans. <laughs> I don't know. And that's the thing. I don't know. Nobody knows. But... The lack of firm evidence does not mean that people don't create these kind of visuals. So, um, and while we're at it, why don't we just toss genetically modified crops under the bus as well? There are a few weird things going on here. Uh, both stuff that we see and stuff that we do not see. I mean, there's a few things that I, I want you to point out. Uh, want to point out to you. How, for instance, can we have minus 10% of something? How can we have minus on a scale like this? Well, the reason for it to be minus is to have the intercept, i.e. the way that the lines intercept and intersect each other to kind of look good. This is classic manipulation of a visual. The whole point is to show that there is a connection between the incidence of thyroid cancer and the glyphosate amount applied to corn and soy. These correlate. There is no causal link that has been established. Has anybody ever seen this gentleman? This is a British physician called Andrew Wakefield. And in 1998, he published a study linking the MMR vaccine to autism. That study has been thoroughly torn to shreds. In fact, he's been tossed out of the British Med Medical Association. He is no longer allowed to practice medicine. Unfortunately, that didn't stop people from thinking that vaccines cause autism and yada, yada, yada. And let's think of this. What kind of consequences does this information have? Well, the global anti-vaccine movement, which is running rampant, especially under COVID conditions, but even before COVID, uh, when it comes to the MMR stuff, they got a serious amount of wind in their sails. And we can use that data to push an agenda and combine probably very innocent things together, like this. 
So we can see that the sales of organic food is going up. We can see that the autism prevalence is going up. That's all we can see. We don't know why. We don't know why organic food sales is going up. We don't know why the prevalence for autism is going up. That's it. Remember that people see what they want to see. Consider a family having a child by being diagnosed with autism. That is a terrible experience. And it's not far-fetched to think that in their grief, in their, their fear, in their anger, they, they go to the internet and they try to figure out why have their child been struck with this? Why has this calamity happened to them? And they find this. They find something to latch on to. We're seeing data, but this is not as much data as it is the human factor, the human condition. Everything has consequences. Suddenly they have something to latch on to and something to lash out on. And we just went from a fairly innocent visual to people in the streets. This is extremely dangerous. What can we learn from this? Well, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Just because you can compare things and just because you can whip up funny correlations doesn't mean you should. Everything you do has consequences. And scale will decide the curve. If I want to, I can make just about any curve intercept another curve, as long as you fiddle with the scales. Again, don't do that. Have zero as a baseline. There's a reason for that. And finally, if you forget everything from this session, remember this. Correlation does not equal causation. Just because two things happen at the same time does not mean that they are happening because of each other. It's time to dive into the fifth and the, the final part, I should say. We're just going to start with the Indian Bharatiya Janata Party, or BJT. They put up a um, kind of funny thing on, on Twitter. They, they have a pretty clear agenda, right? They're, they're political, and their agenda is to make sure that Narendra Modi stays the Prime Minister of India. And like many other political organizations, they kind of play fast and loose with numbers. I mean, apparently, the constituents are roughly uh, as smart as a brick. Uh, so they, 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 they put up this on Twitter. I'm the first to, to, to be very clear. I'm terrible at the math. But even I figure something is not entirely correct here. <laughs> a bit. Okay, so what do we do? Well, let's defluff it. Let's take away all the weird stuff that we're looking at. Again, it's because of the fluff that we not immediately see that something is wrong. So let's clear off the bars. There we have numbers. Without the bars, the mind don't have anything to latch on to. So suddenly we can see the progression of numbers and go, yeah, that's, that's reasonable. And we can do it even more than this. What if we were to put back the bars as it should have looked? Huh, that's kind of a different message, isn't it? And this, this was obvious. This is what we should have seen. This is a wonderful example of misleading or just lying to your face with a visual. They didn't even try to hide it. It's clear for everybody to see. Consider how many people actually did. In many ways, it doesn't matter if you're, try, if, if you're convincing everyone. As long as you're convincing someone, well, you kind of made your point. Oh, we're going to go to the US. And this is a bit of a um, sensitive issue. I'm not dumb enough to dive into the um, latest um, election. That's walking on a minefield. This is bad enough. So in 2012, there was a, the election that saw the um, 
Barack Obama, the, the incumbent uh, Democratic president, he was challenged by the Republican candidate Mitt Romney. Okay. So this is a map of the, the U.S. The, well, it's both the continental U.S. and uh, Hawaii. And if we were to color the states that voted Democrat blue and the states that voted Republican red, this is what we're going to see. There is a lot of Republicans here. There's a lot of people voting re uh, Republican, right? Yeah. But it turns out that the states themselves, they're kind of divided into um, smaller chunks, i.e. counties. And then it looks like this instead. Holy cow, that is a lot of red. Uh, I mean, just looking at this map, isn't it obvious that the Republicans should have won? It is, is it, isn't it obvious that Mitt Romney had probably won the election? Just look at the number of red stuff. They had their election taken away from them. Have you heard that narrative before? Stop the steal. So, okay, this is the question. Should they have won? Well, that was kind of the, the narrative that people was trying to push. I didn't say they won. I'm saying they should have won. And that's all people need to hear. Well, obviously they should have won. Obviously, there is something wrong with the election. Pitchforks out and to the streets we go. And yes, there is a lot of things wrong with the US election system, but no, I'm not going to touch on that. The thing is, land don't vote. People do. And if you were to look at the number of voters per county or actually per state, we're going to see that uh, there's a heck of a lot of people living in California. Like, in California, we have millions of people. And in Wyoming, we have millions of cattle. They do a lot of things, but they do not vote. Well, some of them might do, actually, but that's, yeah. And, and here's the thing. Over here, we have the people. And if we take that data and do the math again, we're going to find that, huh, the Democrats actually did win because the number of people Voting Democrat was much higher than the number of counties doing so. Land don't vote. We have this tendency whenever we see a map to think that everything is, is equal. If we have a map of the US, for instance, we tend to assign every area the same number. So that's why we look at a map to see a crap ton of red and go, huh, I think the Republicans won. That is a dangerous thing with maps. It's nothing wrong with the maps. It's just the way we tend to interpret them. Meaning that if you were to show a map, you need to consider this. We're going to stay in the US. We're going to go to Florida. Florida is a wonderful state. It's warm. I enjoy warm. It's kind of windy sometimes. That's part of the fun, I suppose. They also enacted a law back in 2005, the so-called Stand Your Ground law. Stand Your Ground is a law that gives you the right to exercise deadly force if you are being attacked. It gets worse than that. It is completely fine for you to pull a gun and shoot someone in the head if you feel threatened. Hmm. And it's also perfectly fine for you to shoot the same person in the head again, regardless if you could have de-escalated by just backing away. So they put up this. This is Reuters, kind of a big news outlet. They put this up to show what happened at 2005. There are a few things kind of sticking out here. When I saw this, I literally poured my coffee down my windpipe, because 721 is kind of less than 873. How the heck did we manage to do this visual? Well, that's why. They turned the damn thing on its head. They turned the visual on its head. This is what it should have looked like. 
What can we conclude from this? Well, when they enacted Stand Your Ground, the number of deadly homicides, or it's not technically a homicide, it's just self-defense, it skyrocketed. Who'd have thought that? This is not acceptable. This is an outright lie by Reuters. I did some research and I found that uh, somebody had asked the, the artist that did this visual and asked them, why? How did you come up with this? And the response was, well, I wanted to show how the blood flows down. I'm going to call bullshit on that one. Speaking of bullshit, let's go to the UK again. The UK, um, from the start of the pandemic, they've been putting out the weekly COVID-19 report. It's been identical since the start of the pandemic in, in 2019. And this is what UK has looked like. So we have a map, we have colored areas showing the, um, the, the prevalence of, of uh, COVID. All right. So this was the case up until week 40 of 2020. From week 40 and onwards, they slightly tweaked it to call it the weekly COVID-19 and seasonal flu report because they're adding the seasonal flu as well. And as we can see back in week 40, the UK finally managed to break the COVID infection. Everything was fine in the UK in the week 40. Or was it? There is no difference between the report of week 39 and week 40, apart from this. Look at the scales. They changed the scales, and thus they changed the coloring. There is no information about this. Nothing. How do people look at this data? Well, they're probably going to look at it and go, yeah, everything is much better. I'm going to go buy stuff, or I'm going to go without a mask. God knows what. You don't do this. People see what they want to see. We want this pandemic to be over. Trust me, I do. And when I see something like this, well, apparently it's kind of normal. So um, where do we go from here? Well, people have a limited attention span. People are not stupid. No. God, no. That is not what I'm saying. But people have a limited attention span. And just like I can choose who I ask and what I ask, I can pretty much guarantee that you're going to draw a specific set of conclusions. That makes me, with data, infinitely more dangerous than someone just screaming. And always be careful with maps. Because as I said, we have a tendency to ascribe a map a specific number. All the, the different areas of the map has the same value, if you will. That is something that is intrinsic to our minds. That's how we've learned to look at maps. I.e., be very, very careful when you're dealing with colored maps, so-called choropleth maps. Visuals are powerful. Most of us are predominantly visual, meaning that we assign more um, impact to visuals. And again, how many people actually look at the data? We look at the visual, we correlate with what we want to see. There we go. My goal was to show you how easy it is to trick people with visuals. And when I started building this session out, I, I had it in my head for a long time, and I started building it out roughly two years ago. And I wasn't expecting to find just as much shenanigans as I did. I mean, it's, it's rampant, the stuff people do. And even established news outlets occasionally make mistakes. And if you're tired of the mistakes, just go to look at Fox. That's not a mistake. That's intentional. And th this was hilarious for a bit. Because I realized how much crap is out there. And if these fairly basic things manage to fool so many people, what is it out there that I didn't even see? I am in no way immune from 
disinformation and, and crappy visuals. I like to think that it is harder to fool me than most people who do not spend their, their entire day working with data. But I'm sure that I will be easy to fool as well. So the question is, are we doomed? Well, no, I don't think so. I don't think so, unless we choose to be. Everybody has a choice. We always have a choice to be better. I can always be better tomorrow than I was today or yesterday. That is a choice. That's how I go through life. I want to change. I want to learn. I think it is still possible to make people, well, basically help them think, help them realize that things might not be as easy or simple as they seem. We crave simplicity. We, sadly, we can't have it. And I think that solution is just as, as obvious as it, it is rare. The solution is called data literacy training. We know automatically to, well, how do you interpret red lights, right? We know not to buy things from strange men in alleys. We know not to eat yellow snow. These things are obvious. It's, they're, they're called common sense. And they're common sense because we've been told this over and over and over again. What if we were able to make charts and reading charts and reading data equally common sense? What if we were able to teach this and, and this kind of, of um, criti uh, critical thinking in school? What if we were able to give our kids the basic insights like this in school. How difficult do you think it would be to fool them? There are many, many ways of doing this. I highly recommend any of these books. Anything by, by um, Alberto Kyrie is fantastic. Uh, we have a personal favorite of mine, Hans Rosling. Uh, he was taken from us way too early. Uh, he had this fantastic way of making data approachable, making data easy to relate to, and no bullshit. Um, he never made anything too, too difficult. It's both interesting and exciting, though, so don't blame me if you start to read this and kind of fall into the, the, um, the very, very deep hole that data visualization is. It's a fantastic field. So many impressive people writing stuff, uh, so much interesting information, uh, so much insight into the human condition and, and psychology that you might not expect when you went in there. We've seen examples of everything from fairly innocent mistakes to outright lies. So what can we conclude from this hour? Well, we can, for starters, with great power, be I, sorry, I had to, again, I use power BI, comes great responsibility. It is up on you that does the visual to think about how can this be interpreted. I'm not going to give anyone who just whipped up a visual and, well, it's up to you to, to figure out what you're looking at. No, it's the person that crafts the visual that has the responsibility to make sure that it is as clear, as concise as possible. And we see what we want to see every day. It's the same mechanism underneath racism. For instance, we see what we want to see. As soon as something happens that fits a narrative that we know, well, we're just going with that's the fact. It supports my facts. Something else comes along that does not conform to what I know. What do I do? I discard it. It's apparently something strange. So that's how the mind works. And I still think that increasing data, li data literacy is key. We can sort this. It's not going to be easy. But it can be done, and it must be done. It must, must, must be done. I want you. Well, let me rephrase that. I challenge you to go out and help others become more data literate. You might not think it, but this hour has given you more points in the data literacy column. Help others. 
not everyone can go to this or read a book or see this. Whenever you hear something strange related to data, explain things. Don't just let it slide. We're not doomed yet. Not quite yet. Be observant. Be curious. Be literate. And you won't get burned. My name is Alexander, and I thank you so much for this session.